1950, if a girl conceived a child out of wedlock, it would humiliate the parents down to their shoelaces, and the poor daughter would be sent away to an, another family, a relative far away. We had a girl that conceived a child when I was in high school. Her parents immediately sent her to Phoenix, Arizona. We never seen her again. They did not want to bear the shame and disgrace of a pregnant daughter. I cannot tell you how many girls conceived a child in the debated public school last year. You don't want to know. Most high schools today have a caretaking facility to take care of the children born to single pregnant high school girls. You think that? Is that true? Yeah. I'm telling you the truth. America's lost its virtue. Amen. We are a nation without shame. There's nothing that would embarrass this country today. In 1950, America could blush. It wasn't a perfect society. In 1950, my grandfather, Jess Francis Cruz, stood on this hilltop up here and condemned the sin and wickedness that he saw in 1950. <laughs> and he made us feel this oh, yeah. high because her. <coughs> from his point of view, he remembered America in 1900. Yes. And he would tell us what America was in 1900, and we got the feeling that we were nothing but a bunch of wicked slobs. Yeah. <laughs> Even though we were church going people and as far as we know we weren't doing anything wrong but apparently we were I don't know what we were doing wrong he never got that specific he didn't meddle that close now in 1950 there was no gender blending it in 1950, for someone to claim that God is feminine, they would think you had just escaped from the nut house. I'm, I'm serious. That would have been something people would have thought, well, that guy's, that guy's lost his marbles. You know, to think that God is feminine or to think that we've got to blend, gender blend We've got to live in a gender-blended society. That's hogwash! Yeah. It was unheard of in 1950. I can't even imagine. In 1950, you wouldn't believe how girls dressed with their saddle oxfords. Does anyone remember saddle oxfords? Yes. <laughs> well, they, I mean, girls dress so uniquely girlish that the, you could never mistake their identity. And the skirts were below, the, the hem was below the knee. Thank you, girl. Close to the ankle. There's a 1950 girl. That's right. Now, church, it's amazing how far we've come. And that all took place since 1950. Yeah. 1950. When I graduated out of high school, I honestly believed, listening to the preaching of my grandfather, that this nation was already going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. Because he was comparing it to 1900. Sure. And today we're comparing it to 1950. And 1950 looks pretty doggone good. Yeah. Oh my goodness, if we could only go back there. If we went back to 1900, we'd be living in paradise Amen. in many ways. Amen. Now, I'm going to close this discussion, church, by asking you to look at something. America was a covenant land under a covenant God established by a covenant people. And that business card would be right on target. 
If they had added, what's at the bottom of this page? Yes. That our founding fathers, our pilgrim Puritan fathers, in the early 1600s when they arrived in the shores of this nation, their first effort was to kneel and pray and enter into covenantal pledges with their God. Amen. The Mayflower Compact is one example among many. Amen. Yes. And they, they covenanted together to love, serve, honor, and obey God and His Word, and to love and serve one another. That was the terms of the covenant. They had to be faithful to the covenant law of their God. Amen. Number two, they understood by this covenant that it was conditional. Conditional upon their obedience to the covenant terms. Conditions of the covenant required obedience. And number three, they understood that disobedience to the covenant would bring divine chastening and retribution depending on the nature of their willful or, I guess their willful departure from the covenant. Yeah. So number three, they knew that departure from the covenant would equal a chastening hand from heaven. Amen. They didn't blame it on the Russians. <laughs> or anyone else. They knew that they were responsible. And whether it was Indian attack, famine, whatever came their way in the way of chastening, a chastening chastisement, they were on their knees and they knew the only road back was God-fearing, Bible-believing, Spirit-filled repentance. Amen. Only heartfelt repentance and turning from their wickedness would restore the covenant and avoid national apostasy and or catastrophic judgment from God. That is the contract under which this nation was established as the land of Joseph. The birthright land. We are the leading birthright nation in the world. The leading birthright nation fulfilling the mandate of Joseph. We took this land under a covenant. And only when we come back and restore that covenant. Would God ever hear our prayer. Amen. Now hear this and hear it well because we're at the end. Either this nation comes to repentance very quickly. Or we move deeper into apostasy and I believe catastrophic judgment. Amen. Amen. Catastrophic. It's going to be catastrophism. <laughs> It'll be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah's flood, and all the other catastrophic events. You write down all the list of the most cataclysmic events you can write down. Put them all together, that's what's coming our way if there's Amen. no repentance. Amen. There was a little glimmer of hope. I got a call at 4 o'clock this afternoon, 4.30, I'm sorry, from a good friend of mine that was down in Springfield. He said, if you did not know what went on at the Trump rally, I'm calling you to let you know. He said, there were far more people on the outside of that yeah. rally than there were on the inside, and he was on the inside Barely. And he said the outside swelled with so many people that they lost all their ability to estimate the crowd. <laughs> but he said what he did observe were people that were actually praying, Amen. praying in the line while they waited. Hallelujah. He said that he heard delivered. Probably the most heart-stirring call to repentance that he had ever heard.